So, come up to the lab and see what's on the slab. Hello. Uh, in this third video of my Halloween 2021 series, we're going to be discussing James Whale's 1931 film, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. You're putting me on. No, it's pronounced Frankenstein. I'm joined by Dr. Jeffrey Yeager to talk about this. Um, so first off, Jeff, thanks for being here. Glad to be here, Phil. Um, I do want to preliminarily say my internet connection is shit right now. So uh, if Jeff freezes or lags or anything like that, that's my internet's fault and not Jeff's fault. Um, so, Dr. Jeff Yeager currently serves as an instructor of English at Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College, where he teaches courses in composition, technical writing, American literature, British literature, Western world literature, and film. Jeff completed his doctorate in 19th and early 20th century American literature from West Virginia University in 2020. In addition to his research specialization, Jeff also has a special interest in classical studies and film studies. In his spare time, Jeff is an avid sports fan, particularly for his Atlanta Braves, and he's also a passionate PlayStation gamer. Uh, and I know Jeff is a big horror fan, so uh, you should get some great insights into Frankenstein. Uh, so to start us off, Jeff, can you give us a brief plot summary of the film? Yeah, so I just rewatched the film today. It's completely different from the Frankenstein novel. I mean, yeah, there's these two these two texts are completely different. And we start we start this out with Frankenstein and his assistant like in a graveyard like getting ready to go rob a grave. And, uh, you know, we have him getting ready to create this experiment, create life. But also we have this whole family drama going on too with uh, Frankenstein. And yeah, it's, it's, complete, it's completely strange. Nothing, nothing similar to, to the novel at all. And you know, we, we have, his sister, or not his sister, but we have a doc, his professor who goes, who takes his family to the castle and the professor gets involved with his experiments as he, do, as he does them. Yeah. They create the monster and, and then lots of shenanigans ensue afterwards. So. Okay. You know, eventually, eventually leading to the monster, of course, so. Uh, escaping and like, accidentally killing the little girl and then the townspeople, the riders chasing him down to his final, his final end, we could say. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So, I mean, you've introduced there a lot of the, the themes and ideas that I want us to talk about. And I mean, we're going to keep coming back to how different this film is from the book. Um, and I, I want to start out with that idea of like the first time we see what well, it's Henry Frankenstein in the movie, right? It's, Hen it's Henry, I think. It, and Vic it is. in the novel, it's Victor Frankenstein. So here Victor is a different guy and we get Henry Frankenstein. Um, in, in Mary Shelley's novel, there's a, a massive amount of emphasis on Victor Frankenstein as scientist. Like he's doing science, he's doing medical research. As you said, the first thing we get here is he's creeping around a graveyard to steal a dead body. Um, and so for a story, for a novel where the theme is so much about science corrupted, like how does it change? How does it change the theme of the film that we get introduced to Frankenstein not as scientist but almost as ghoul? 
Yeah, I think it changes it around completely. This is a topic that I did a lot of writing about with with the novel, actually. But you know, this idea of the mad scientist character is a trope that's extended yeah. you know, to several other authors, like Hawk with Annual Hawthorne, um, the birthmark, right? It's a, that's an interesting st- other story that's similar to this. Mm-hmm. But this takes this kind of this takes away Frankenstein's credibility right? his ethos in a sense right? yeah he's, he does not look like a scientist at all in the beginning if, if he is he's a uh, some kind of strange pseudoscientist in the 19th century so whenever we get the only link of credibility that he has is with his professor so that's the only link that establishes him as being part of the scientific world at all yeah, so it, it is. In, it is interesting. Uh, it kind of suggests like any kind of crazy rogue medical student can go do something like this, right? Which perhaps adds to the horror for a '30s audience, maybe. So. Yeah. So, um, one of the other things uh, that I was thinking about here i mean we got that sort of shift from here's an actual scientist to here's a sort of rogue mad scientist type figure we've also got the introduction of this idea of the abnormal brain that's taken right because in the novel that simply doesn't happen um and i don't know i think this is another thing that's meant to be sort of potentially terrifying for a 30s audience because the assistant goes and gets the abnormal brain from the uh, brain vault or whatever it is and brings it back and we're supposed to believe that the monster is inherently criminal because it was a criminal's brain. And I think there's a, a massive amount of stuff we could say about that, but I want I want to know what you think is most sort of interesting or important about that idea of the abnormal brain. Yeah, I just wanted to start this question out by making a young Frankenstein reference, right? Abby normal. Yep. <laughs> they, they, poke, they poke at this in young Frankenstein. But it is it is interesting in the because uh, I'm currently rereading the novel as well. So much of the novel is built on the idea of nature versus nurture. Yeah, like how much how much is this monster really a monster based on his inner nature, right? Versus like his inner nature, how in the age of genetics, for instance, like if he's made of all these different parts, what does that? What does that create as far as his inner nature, right? Yeah. Whereas, whereas the novel was concerned with nurture, right? Monster did not get any nurturing. The only nurturing he got in the novel was when he's observing the family. Um, of course, we know that Mary Shelley came come, came from the Romantic tradition, right? Which mm-hmm. emphasized things like John Locke, right? The blanks, everybody's a blank slate. Yeah. You know, this. So, um, I, guess, I guess where I'm going with this is it's, it's just definitely along the lines of nature and nurture, and especially with the film here, too. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and, and, and super, super important. Um, and I mean, if we think about this in the context of the early 30s, right, like Freudian psychoanalysis takes off in the 20s and into the 30s, it's incredibly influential. And so these ideas of like the criminal brain, the malfunctioning brain and all these things would very much have been in sort of the cultural zeitgeist. But the other thing I think that's that's interesting in terms of the nature versus nurture issue is that in the novel the monster becomes very intelligent right like he learns 
poetry and philosophy and religion, and he's articulate and he has deep philosophical thoughts. In the film, all of that is gone. So what do you make of that element of it? Yeah, we have to kind of assume that his brain is is unusually sharp in the novel. Yeah. Why why is that? It's hard to say whether whether he Victor got the brain of a uh, esteemed scientist or something like that, right? Someone smart who could pick up on these things quickly. Um, my students struggle to read Paradise Lost, right? So how this is the monster's first book in the yeah. uh, in novel, right? So he, he's 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 very clearly brilliant. In the not in in this, right? He never gets past that childhood development stage. We we could definitely dive into Freud and Lacan and all of that here, but um, if you remember in the novel, right, he looks into the uh, river for the first. Step the lake, I think, for the first time and sees his reflection, right, which is very mirror stage of yeah. Lacan, right? Or here, we don't even get that, right? He, he did, we don't really get him having an understanding of himself as a person in that yeah. way, like Lacan, or, Lacan argues like when a baby looks in the mirror the first time, that's when a baby becomes a person. So we don't we don't even get that sort of stage of childhood development here. Uh, he's he's pretty much just a just a helpless child. Like he had, this is very much akin to we could bring disability studies into this too, right? He can't communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he can't. So maybe his brain from his past life, the abnormal brain, right? Maybe it's developed, but he can but he can't, he still can't communicate. So he, he very much feels like a, an infant trapped in this giant body, which has had to be very scary. He's not aware of his own strength, as we see. So, yeah. So I don't think he's past the infant stage. That's, that's part of why he's so, he's like this. I don't think, I don't think the brain being abnormal or the brain coming from a murderer like, I don't know how much that has to do with with his actions here, as much as just the fact he's an infant trapped in the body of a giant, right? He's unaware of his strength. So, I, I don't know if you agree or disagree with me there, Phil, but it's my insights. Well, I think that's a great insight. Um, I don't I, I feel like that's one of those things where like what you just said makes perfect sense and I, I think it's absolutely right. I don't know if the 30s would necessarily agree, but the 30 like the 30s also they didn't really understand as much about how the mind works as we do today. So I think they would probably be much more open to the idea that if you have a murderer's brain or something like that, you're going to murder because the brain is the brain. And I'm not sure that that's right. I, and I think, think you're, you're raising a really interesting question here because like, we don't necessarily, I don't get the sense in the film that the creature is alive for that long. So we don't know whether or not he could have developed and could have become a philosopher or an artist or whatever it was that we see the potential for in Shelley's novel. I think at this point in the movie, he's no more developed than he was when he first entered Victor's bedroom in the novel. Right? He's, yeah. he's, never, passed, he's never passed that point. So. Yeah. I can imagine, like we we see constant like anxiety attacks and the monster yeah. and things like that. It's no, it's no one, right? It's a, yeah, that he's because he's not past that stage. So again, from a modern psychological point of view, right, we're divorce ourselves from the '30s, right? I think we're on onto something. But in the '30s, right, I can see where they would be like, oh, 
you know, this brain is bad, this person was born bad, right? They were kind of more along the lines of nature in those days. Yeah. Um, we could we could dive into a whole can of worms there as far as <laughs> as far as that goes. But. Well, so I think the other the other interesting issue that's raised by the monster's lack of development is and this is also something that you had introduced in your in your plot summary at the beginning is the different family dynamics between the movie and the novel because in the novel i don't rem i mean victor has a a fiance but she's not really part of the novel she's sort of there as a prop i think um but in the novel one of the big things is that the creature demands that victor build him a mate so that he's not alone whereas in the film the creature like the the idea of building the creature a mate never even comes up like it's and the creature is clearly not in any position to articulate that whereas henry frankenstein has these much more developed family dynamics and um and and uh stuff like this like he he's got a fiance right and she's a major player in the film in a way that she simply isn't in the novel so what do you make of these different family dynamics that we've got between the two Yeah, I think you're right to point out that I think it's Elizabeth in the novel. I think that, I might, you might correct me on that. I don't remember. But, it's uh, been years very, since I read it. Yeah. yeah, she's very much a prop, right? She was adopted into the family at an early age with the assumption that she would eventually marry Victor. So it's a, that we have this type of like arranged marriage type of thing going on in the novel. Here, these two very much seem in love. Um, yeah. She seems to adore, she seems to adore Henry Frankenstein in this case. We had, I noticed too, we had this strange like, love triangle, right? Where Vic, the guy named Victor is kind of in love with her at the same time. So there's, there's a whole interesting dynamic there too. Yeah. Very weird. I've always, I've always kind of, str I've always kind of struggled to wrap my mind around why the Universal monster movies, all of them, like change these basic names and plots and things like this so much. But definitely, perhaps it humanizes Henry a little more. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a sharp contrast from where he was at the beginning. Yeah. It goes to show that he's not as insane as he looks because when the family comes up to his laboratory, right, he's like, Yeah, I'm clearly sane, right? Look at look at look at this. Right? I'm clearly sane, you'll see as soon as it comes to life. So we have a whole insanity versus sanity thing going on too with the family. I think that's part of why they're there is to Crown them a little bit. I think that's spot on. Uh, though it's probably a bad sign when when the evidence for your sanity is I've stolen a corpse and I'm gonna electrocute <laughs> it until it comes back to life. But yeah, the, yeah. His, prof his professor was very accepting of that, right? He wasn't like, no, this isn't unethical or whatever, right? He was even yeah. kind of like assisting with the experiments after that. So. Yeah, the like it doesn't. It's it's a weird scene in the movie for me when when the family and the professor Victor and and uh, the fiance's name who I can't remember off the top of my head, like when they all show up and he's like, yeah, so I've been uh, stealing dead bodies to reanimate them and they're just like, that seems fine. Like in like, real life, I have, yeah. Like in real life, I have to imagine if someone like said that to their family members, they'd be like, listen, ma'am, let's get you some help. You can come <laughs> back to science after you've had a bit of a rest. But no, they're just like, yeah, that's fine. We're not even worried about that. But the other element of that that, 
that um, that I, I think is really interesting. Once the creature is brought to life, Henry Frankenstein becomes much more like yeah, I want to like go home and hang out with my fiance now and I want to like have a normal life. And so we do like you you're absolutely right. There is this stark contrast between the Henry Frankenstein of the first half of the movie and the Henry Frankenstein of the second half. Because he is the hero of the film ultimately. In, the, in a way that Victor Frankenstein is not the hero of the novel. It's, it's much less ambiguous, I think. You may agree or disagree yeah. with that. Yeah, there's this insinuation, like there's a marriage plot line here where she's getting married, where Henry and Elizabeth, I think, are getting married. You know, so um, there's this insinuation that maybe being part of this family will cause this sort of antisocial behavior that Victor's demonstrating. They even go do these things to stop. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's becoming assimilated into normal culture, so to speak. So, um, yeah, the, the shift is very abrupt. It's, he leaves the professor there with the monster, which ends badly as we as we saw, so um, yeah, the, it's this insinuation like we have, we have this desire. He no longer needs to have a desire to play God or whatever, right? Because you know, he can. He's now going to go go through the normal sort of process. Maybe maybe he'll have children, right? So he can play God with them. Almost totally. Right, kind of abandons the monster, just like in the novel. Maybe not. For, yeah, we don't. We don't get that he's repulsed by the monster in this, like he was in the novel. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no sign of that, other than kind of like keeping the monster at bay. So, um, yeah, it, it is, it is strange. Like in the novel, we know that he runs because. He's repulsed at what he does, and he's repulsed by the monster's looks and appearance. Yeah. Yeah. He, ha he has the weird dream in the novel, too. <laughs> but um, here, right, it's, it's almost like, oh, yeah, I've done my part for science. Let's, let's go start a family now. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, you have anything to add to that, Phil. That's, that's random faults that I kind of threw out. No, I think that's good. Um, and I, I think that actually takes us sort of to the last question that I wanted to, to discuss, which is about the ending of the movie, um, particularly the scene in the windmill. Because this, to me, is actually one of the most troubling scenes in any of the Universal Monster movies that I've watched. Because um, on... I mean, in a way like the novel, but in a much more in a much more clumsy way, it does come down to a sort of fight to the death between Henry and the creature. But then the the rioting peasants of this of this community light the windmill on fire with the creature in it. And like to me, the the screams of the creature, the first time in the film that the creature really sounds human is the screams of terror as he's literally being burned alive by this mob. But that's one of the most troubling things to me. So, like, uh, there's a lot to unpack with the ending. The the conflict between Henry and the creature as this sort of life and death, almost action movie type struggle. Uh, I, I I think we're supposed to empathize 
with the creature at the end. But I also get the sense that that's not like the intention of the filmmakers. And I get, I, I get the sense that we're supposed to be critical of the rioting peasants. But I, again, I don't think that's like the obvious, like surface level purpose of the film. So I'm going to let you take it from there because I've given you a lot of stuff to potentially respond to. Yeah. So first off, the mob, that the mob Frankenstein for all this, the mob carrying their pitchforks and fire, right? You know, that's that's just an iconic image in horror. So I just wanted to just mention that to begin with. But you um, broke up a little bit there. So can I get you to just repeat that? Yeah, I just wanted to mention first, like the idea of the mob, right, being almost an iconic part of this movie. Because yeah. whenever you see, whenever you see images of the film, right, normally it's the mob going to the castle with their pitchforks and fire and whatnot. So that that's almost becomes as synonymous with the movie as as the appearance of the monster. Yeah. But, the, but as far as like the, the themes of why they did it this way, I think that going back to what we were talking about earlier with the creature not having a mate or something like that. The creature does go into Elizabeth's wedding chamber, right? And there's this insinuation like he's trying to attack her. Maybe he just wants, maybe he just wants a friend or something, right? But 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 that, that's very taboo, right? Yeah. To be to be in her wedding chamber. There's that could, there's an insinuation that that might be a type of like sexual assault or something. So I could see why Victor would, why that that scene in particular kind of makes Victor the hero here because he's defending his fiance's honor, yeah, and all of that, right? If they if it wouldn't have been for that scene, um, they would, I definitely don't think that would have made as much sense as as it does. But it is. It's very disturbing. It's it's very horrifying that they burn this creature alive the way they do hearing his, hearing his screams i can i mean i can i can i don't know i don't know like if he's still at that infant stage right would he make that scream um, he's def, he spends the whole movie anxious right mm-hmm. he's he's a child in an adult's body he's he's definitely afraid of fire we get that a couple of times before this So, yeah, it, it does kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth. And I was I was actually thinking that the film would end. Like, that was a really cool shot in the film, which is like from the long shot where it shows the castle from way off. So I thought the film was actually going to end with that. But then we go back to Victor, back in domestic life again, one more scene after that. Yeah. So I kind of I kind of got faked out even by the movie because I thought that it was going to end on that shot of the monster burning, but no, it ends with him being back in this domestic bliss where he's supposedly going to forget about about the whole thing. So it's 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 troubling in the sense that the creature is never looked at as human, right? He's the professor says at one point like put him down like a rabid dog. I think that's kind of like how it's how he's looked at here. He's it's putting down a rabid dog, more or yeah. less. Well, I think that I think that's really interesting that you brought up that final scene where, like, they're back in the the Baron's mansion or wherever it is, and they're good. Like the servants all want to bring Henry some wine, and they like go to open the door, and the dad's like, no. They're having sex. We can't. Well, I'll drink the wine. Like, but I think the I think the point of that scene is largely just to sort of establish that Henry survived, right? Because the creature throws him off, right? throws him, or he falls off the the windmill in this struggle, and he like hits one of the blades of the windmill on the way down, which presumably is what cushions his fall before he hits the ground. 
But the fact that they have that scene where it's like, Henry is, has survived, he's won the single combat, which is actually largely combat between the, the mob and the creature. But Henry has triumphed. He's returned to this domestic environment. And that's the happy ending of the film. Like That's what makes me think that at least on some level, the film doesn't want us to empathize with the creature and doesn't want us to condemn the mob. Like I, I, I just have the, the sense that the film's sort of official politics are the creature is bad and deserves to be destroyed. Henry and the mob are good and deserve to win. But well, I see it exactly opposite of that. Let's go back to the scene where the monster kills the little girl. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you think in that scene that that was a case of the monster not knowing his own strength? Like, because she, she says, oh, you're hurting me. And then he kind of like throws her in the, in the water. Or do you, like, do you think that the monster did that with his abnormal brain, right? The fact that he would throw her into the river because at, at first, when I was watching that scene, I thought, hey, um, he just doesn't know his own strength. But then he kind of like maliciously throws her into the into the water where she supposedly drowns. It wasn't, it wasn't like in the novel where he kind of strangles William Frankenstein, like he yeah. doesn't know his own strength. It's not like that. So yeah, I, I'm I mean, positing like maybe that scene. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the film wants us to read that as the abnormal brain, the murderer's brain. I don't. I again, I I kind of don't buy it because if you look at what's happening immediately before that, she was like, "Let's float these pedals on the water. Just chuck the pedal out onto the water, and it'll float, and it'll and it's fun." He, I mean, the creature in the film clearly does not have command of language. There's not that much evidence that he sort of comprehends language. So when she says, you're hurting me, I don't know that, I don't know that that's meaningful for him in any way. Because as you were saying before, I think he's, he's at a sort of pre-linguistic stage. And so... I, I see it like if you have a child's brain or something like this, if you, you, if you have an undeveloped mind, it's easy to see how you would transfer the principle of throw the pedal on the water and it floats and it's fun to throw the child on the water and it floats mm -hmm. and it's fun. So I, I mean, Again, I think it's one of those things where the film kind of intends for us to read it as this is an evil act by a horrible monster with a, a criminal brain. But I, I, so much of the texture of what happens in the film tells me that that's not, that's not what's really going on. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you there because... I assume that it was because he just was trying to be gentle, but it does. I think the film does ask us to read it. That yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. Feel the films. This is a case of where maybe directorial intent. The way that we read the film are two completely different things. As we know, as literature scholars, we can't yeah. always take the intent to that face value. But, uh, well, but that that actually makes me one. Like as we've been talking about this, that actually makes me wonder. I've been kind of positing a distinction between here's what the film wants us to think in this very sort of simple. Uh, moralistic dichotomy of good and evil but i see the film doing other things 
maybe that's actually what the film wants. Maybe, maybe the film is doing that complex work and sort of saying, if you're, if you're taking a very simple surface level reading, this is creature bad Henry and riotous mob of villagers with torches good. But if you look at thing like it, Maybe the film does purposefully give us enough stuff to say, actually, that's a really superficial reading and things are more complicated. What do you, do you think, do you think the goal of the film is sort of to say, here's your simple, stupid version of morality, but it's wrong? Or is that giving yeah, too I mean, much I credit? Think no, I, th I think you're onto something there. The film does provoke these questions, right? It, it could be a lot more, it could be even more uh, straightforward than it is. It only does provoke those questions. So, yeah, I, I think even the intent of the film would be maybe to provoke those questions. Right? Yeah. Very, much, very much akin to the novel in that way. Because so much of the novel is about feeling sympathy for the creature. Like, um, how much do you feel sympathy? How much can one feel sympathy for the creature knowing that he didn't know what he was doing in the novel? Here, right? So, yeah, I, th I think it provokes questions. Sometimes the great texts or great films, right? Sometimes they might not even know, you know how deep they are as far as content I think that's a great sentiment to wrap up on no I, I, would, I would say so so great great film great film I really much like the bride too but I didn't bring it up because we're just using Frankenstein because it's own text here. The Bride adds a lot of interesting wrinkles to this. Yeah. I don't know if you can still hear me. My mic froze for a minute and my screen, my image seems to be frozen here, but. Yeah. All right, since I'm yeah, frozen, I still hear you. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap the interview up there. So thanks, Jeff, this is right. really good. I feel look forward to looking at all your videos on the, on these movies. So.